Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Would you please stand for the rendering of the honors? Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Matthew Andrews. I am Ralph's youngest son. And now uh, please join me as we go through a brief history of Ralph Andrews. Ralph was born on December 17, 1927 in Chicago, Illinois. He was raised in Saginaw, Michigan. He was later blessed with a sister named Janice. In high school, he took a liking to speech and debate and took first place in declamation in the Michigan State Speech Competition. When he was 18, he joined the Army, right at the tail end of World War II. He was stationed in Camp Lee, Virginia, and at night he would MC for shows or bingo games. He then got an education at the University of Michigan and Tulane University. I believe this is a fraternity picture. I could be wrong though he never finished a degree, so I don't know where this picture came from. <laughs> he eventually came to LA and got the prestigious job of page boy at NBC. A highlight among the position was working the Academy Awards as a statue presenter. He often brought up that he handed an Oscar to Walt Disney. Now, before he was a game show producer, he was a game show contestant. In 1949, uh, he was on a radio quiz show called Double or Nothing, hosted by Walter O'Keefe. And uh, we have a recording of that. Now we have a gentleman from Saginaw, Michigan, whose name is Ralph Andrews. And Ralph, we're glad to have you. Are you the fourth Andrews sister? No, I'm not. Ralph, you come from Saginaw, and uh, what's your job? Well, right now it's nothing, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> well, Say, that's fine. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What have you done before that? Well, I went to school at uh, several universities around the country. Sort of a vagabond lover in the mm. campus. Yeah. And let me ask you this, Ralph. Uh, you've been out here in Hollywood. Is it your purpose, intent, or desire to uh, be a cinema idol? Well, it's... Going uh, to the movie? I would love it very much, but... Uh, have you done any work in movies? Yes, I have. You did? I worked in one picture. What was that? Mr. Belvedere Goes to College. You did? <laughs> You look like the collegiate type, Ralph. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that was wonderful. Of course, I think that Belvedere character is oh, great. Oh, he's terrific. I mean, he's, he's the Belvedere character is almost as great as Clifton Webb. What did you do in the picture? <laughs> well, I was, uh, I was a student coach. Um, did you I, have any lines? I speak? had seven lines. Seven lines? No. But they were cut to two when the picture came out. <laughs> uh, Ralph, what were the two? Well, you remember, did you see the picture? Certainly oh, I saw it. I saw it twice, so I'd understand it. <laughs> <laughs> but remember when he had his pants rolled up and he, he came dragging his pole behind him? Yeah. And uh, he was about to make a pole vault, and I was down on my knees with a cap on my head, and I looked up at him, and I, he started to say, at what height did Mr... And then I interrupted him. At uh, what height Aren't did Mr... Aren't you going to change your clothes? Uh, that would not be necessary. At what height did Mr. Bluebaker jump, please? 12-3, and that's a new high for him. Oh. Uh. Make it 14. I go, huh? You know, I mean, I pulled all the You had three ones with lines with that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Have you appeared in any other pictures, Ralph? Uh, no, I've, uh, I haven't. Things have been pretty dull out here. That's the excuse I use. Oh, come, I come. Haven't... It's exciting even when it's dull. Oh, sure. Now, uh, your hobby is, uh, what's your hobby? Well, it's, uh, 
dancing, uh, with girls. No. I take my dancing seriously. I like to dance. Well, let me see. And speaking of girls, have you uh, have you uh, ever uh, danced with any uh, celebrities in pictures? Yes, I. Uh, when I was on Belvedere Goes to College, we were on location up at Reno, and uh, the whole company was up there, and I uh, danced with my, my childhood sweetheart. Who was your childhood sweetheart? Shirley Temple. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> my childhood sweetheart was Marie Dressler. <laughs> Uh, you were in the Army? Yes. How long did you serve in the Army, Ralph? About 18 months. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You were given one of those honorable discharges when you got out? Uh, it was an honorable medical discharge. What? Yeah. What I, was... Well, my back could not never get in the proper position to sit and drive a Jeep. <laughs> they discharged me. Oh, I have a bad back. Well, they call it a... You've got a fine-looking back from here. <laughs> Wait till you hear what they call it. A what? spondylolithesis. A what? Spondylolithesis. This is, this is the... It's a bilateral breach of the new arch of Now, wait a On the same... A spondylolithesis. No, 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 no. S-P-O-N-D-Y-L-O-L-I-T-H-E-S-I-S. Spondylolithesis. Well, for heaven's sake. What? <laughs> Look, you got that in the Army. If you got that in private life, what did the doctor no, I didn't get a visit? I didn't get it in the Army. It was, uh, it was congenital, but it was aggravated in the Army. From sitting you have a very fancy vocabulary. What was one of... <laughs> What was one of the universities you got kicked out of? Uh, University of Michigan. Uh, are you Tulane a Michigan University. man? Yeah. What other men are you? Tulane University and MCMT. Restless, weren't you? <laughs> now, Ralph, I'll die if you don't win money here. So will I, believe me. No, it just occurred to me, we've had a delightful talk here and asking the questions. Uh, have you got any pet peeves? Well, um, I don't know. I'll... If I don't win any money on this program, it'll be quiz programs that don't pay off. Quiz programs that don't pay off? With your vocabulary, I'd hate to have you loose in town saying nasty things about me. <laughs> so, Ralph, I'm going to break the rules of the thing here. You've been up here entertaining us for a long while. It's been delightful to have you. I'm not going to ask you any questions. You're $40 ahead right now. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, you've answered enough delightful questions. Here comes the $80 Grand Slam question. Maybe you'll win 80 more. Because the weather, Ralph, was fairly good between June and September last year. People flocked to Coney Island. How many new five-cent pieces did the Mint have to supply New York for the people who spent more money than ever for hot dogs and soda pop? That's a question? Been, um, it has been said out. Uh, it has been said uh, of uh, Hawks, the director, I believe, that he discovered Lauren Bacall. Personally, I feel as if I discovered Ralph Andrews. <laughs> and uh, for what you've done, I'm going to double what I've already done. You got eighty bucks. Sit down. <laughs> Why can't I have contestants like that daily, you know? I think he might have been the only game show contestant in history to win without even playing the game. <laughs> he was certainly charming. Uh, shortly after he moved back to Saginaw and started a career in radio, he began his career as an announcer, disc jockey, and salesman for radio stations WSAM and WKNX. He also met his wife, Margaret, his first wife, Margaret. At the end of that year, Margaret gave birth to twins, Bill and Rick. Yay. At the start of 1953, he had his third child, a daughter named Phyllis, Yay. and apparently they lived at the park at this time. Uh, shortly after, they moved back to Los Angeles to break into television. He returned to his job as a page at NBC, and it was always a source of pride for him because he was one of the few people to ever be at NBC page twice. Uh, but that didn't last long as he was soon made an associate producer on The Betty White Show. 
Part of his job there was getting a studio audience into the theater, and he told me he used to get a band, go out, pick up strangers off the street, and bring them back to the studio. Those were simpler times. He also worked with Ralph Edwards, another prolific game show producer, on It Could Be You. Soon after, Desi Lou Productions, being Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, chose Ralph and Bill Yeagman to take over their live programming. They produced three shows, By the Numbers, Zoom, and Show Me for KTLA in Los Angeles. Around this time, he also had his fourth and fifth child, his, my sister Patrice and my brother Peter. I once asked if he had wanted to have as many kids as he had, and this was his answer. I didn't want to, it didn't, just happened. I mean, uh, I forgot how it was done and it kind of got carried away. <laughs> Then Ralph and Bill left Desi Lou to start their own production company, and they produced the first season of You Don't Say. Ralph flew solo after that with Ralph Andrews Productions, and the rest is history. But instead of listing all his shows, I'd like to show you. The following very, very special program is brought to you in lively black and white on NBC. The name of our show, You Don't Say. If you were fixing some biscuits at the dinner table and your wife had put a jar of honey on the table and you accidentally got some of this honey all over your hands and it was very gummy and gooey and bad, you might make a remark, an exclamation and look at your hands and say, Eek. Eek? Ugh. Uh, oh. Uh, <laughs> you have five seconds, Mike. Uh, uh... <laughs> Time is up. The rain is taping at the bed now. Just wait till uh, boy gets his sentence. The opposite of good is... Bad. Ichabod Crane. <laughs> Hello there, my name is Jack Nard. The name of our game, a bet. As you all know by now, the uh, object of I'll, I'll bet is the game where it's not how much you know that counts, but how much you know about your husband or what. Right. Who wrote the famous Canterbury Tales? That is Bob's first question. Let's see what you think he'll do with it. Bob, who wrote the famous Canterbury Tales? You better bet right on this one, dear. <laughs> Chaucer. Chaucer is right, and she bet right. <laughs> and now, back to the family game and Bob Barker. Now, Charles, your father is a policeman. In your opinion, what does he like best about his job? Well, I guess... Catching the bad men and freeing them in the jail and getting his reward. <laughs> what do you suppose, just in your opinion, what do you think is the biggest reward he ever got? Would you believe one million dollars? <laughs> and I'm Tom Kennedy, name of our show, You Don't Say. Another word for an automobile is called a car. Tin car er L. Tin car 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 L. Tina. Tin car L. Tin car L. Tin car L. Time. Final clue. Um. We, if we're good, go to heaven. If we're bad, we go to... Tinkerbell. That's the name, Tinkerbell. <laughs> Very good. He tried to trap me into saying a bad word, folks. <laughs> yes. and I'm a little bit late, and I, I must apologize. Where is everybody? 
I've heard of staff parties. This is ridiculous. Why is it that every time we try to do one show on time, stars, personality, late, just cause it's Friday, things have been going well all week, you've been in bed, I, Karen, you've been staying up late nights reading your Spiegel catalog, you little devil. Well, we will be right back with the early morning show that's a little bit late, at least very early. Quiet, quiet, the crew is sullen and mutinous, methinks. We'll be back to play, it takes two. I'm really a little tired myself in the post. Uh, Fine. You know, of course, about the question, how old is the oldest dog in recorded history? Meredith and Gordon said, 43 years old. Marge and Pat, 20 years old. Barbara and Gary, 22 years old. So, Emily, for the 13-foot sailboat, my dear, what would you guess be the couple closest to the correct answer? I would say Barbara and Gary. Barbara and Gary at 22 years, okay. Our good friend Duke here brought the answer right along, and he has it around his neck. The oldest dog in recorded history, 27 years old, Barbara and Gary. And I'm Tom Kennedy, and the name of our show, It's Your Bet. the question for Jan. We're going to ask to spell the word roommate. Okay. All right, that's the question. It's your bet, Tony. A hundred points to Jan. All right, Jan, for 100 points, we would like you to spell the word... <coughs> W-O-R-D. <laughs> roommate. Is that no kidding? That's I, it. Roommate. R O O M A T E. Oh. R O O M A T E. Oh, yeah, I left out you an M. You blew it oh, by sorry. one oh, M. Yeah, I'm sorry, I did it. I know. Oh, oh, don't feel like The minute like you spelled it back, it. I. The answer is please, King. There they are. Here's your question. <laughs> <laughs> Which comic strip character best describes Imogene? <laughs> Would you point to it, please? All right. <laughs> Imogene, which of these comic strip characters does King think best describe you? Uh, Blondie, Little Orphan Annie, or Daisy May? Little Orphan Annie. You're right. You got a point. First, we'd like you to welcome one of America's great storytellers and president of the Liars Club, Rod Serling. Now, our panel of liars know the exact description of each of our objects, but they'll tell different stories about them. And it'll be up to you and to our two lie detectors over here to discover which liar is trying to be honest for a change. And the player who recognizes the truth the most number of times will receive $100. It's a, it's a, it's a portable garbage disposal. If you don't want to keep all your garbage at home, you can travel with it. And it really is great. <laughs> At this point, I really don't know what it is. No, I know what it is. This is a, um, see, we've come a, a long way electronically speaking. Are we on the air now? I really don't believe it. I'll be yeah. Okay. Actually, I have this on order. Oh, no. <laughs> now. I'll give you what you want, but I want to... Oh, no, I'd rather shoot you. It's gonna be another one of those deep, deep shows. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Here are today's celebrities. According to British law, what place in all of England is the Queen never permitted to enter? According to British law, what place in all of England is the Queen never permitted to enter? Audience, press the button right now, please. Lucy Arnaz is a long shot, 
at 46 to 1. <laughs> Who is? <laughs> John Axel is the favorite at 2 to 1, and Jay Withers at uh, 10 night 5 to 1, Dean 4 to 1. Okay, Cy, you have $5. Please be careful. You can make a bundle on me, Cy. <laughs> you can clean up I, and I think go I'll to take Florida. that. Lucy Arnaz, $5. Hi, Lucy Arnaz for $5. Please. That's the last five, Cy. Make it rain. Okay, I hope so, Cy. Nice Lucy, man, where Cy. is the queen never permitted to in, uh, enter in England? A gay bar. No, <laughs> I'm really sorry. That's not true. I have the right answer. Because I was in England, and I went on a vacation, and I know it's the House of Commons. Lucy, that's right. You don't say. Betty. Betty. Okay, money bags. Okay, money bags. Uh, <laughs> um, if, if, uh, uh, let's say, let's say, if, if, at the post, at office. the post office, you look you at, look at uh, uh, the address, the address on a letter, on a letter, and you say, oh, and you say, that's, oh, that's 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 gonna, that's, the receiver. that's the receiver. Then you look at, then you look at the return, the return, and you say, and oh, you say, that, oh must that must be the sender, 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 sender. Saunter, Saunter, Sender, Sender, Senderson. Time, Pat. Bob. Bob. Don't let me anything you don't want to do. Say the whole name. I need the publicity. Bob Gridley. Oh, thank you. I'm trying to tell you something. You see, if I get a gun. And I, and I take this gun, gun you see, and you do something, something bad to me. And it was something bad you done to me, right? right? I'm going to shoot you. And you ain't going to heaven. You're going to... Hella. Hella. Sender Hella. Sender Hella. Sender Hella. Right. Welcome to the weekly meeting of The Liars Club. Look at Larry Hobus this morning. Is that a cute on song? Hey, it's my sister's. <laughs> Welcome to the weekly meeting of the Liars Club. No matter what I said about them, they are all the biggest liars in Hollywood. Trust me, it's the truth. Right now, let's meet the players they're going to try and fool tonight, Bill. But oddly enough, it's used in France, and it's used with the guillotine. The, the rope that attaches to the rope blade of the guillotine hooks onto this, and uh, it releases the blade. A lot of men, when they grow up, they uh, turn to Judaism, and the rabbi... <laughs> Uh, this is uh, Jaja Gabor's fingernail clipper. Hundred thousand dollars. Want to see a great gag? <laughs> uh, On NBC's biggest cutting program, the Fifty Grand Slam. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 50 Grand Slam. And now, we're going to go over here, Sister Martha Ann Fitzpatrick. And we're going to turn the sound on. First of all, is the sound on? Can you hear me, Sister Martha Ann? Yes, I can. Good. You can hear me clearly. Yes. All right, I'm going to tell you right now that David Ruckman, we have four questions, and he gave me two correct answers. Now, you need two to tie. You need three to win. Here is your first question. She has accomplished a great deal in our modern pop culture, but she will be best remembered as the woman who gave the world the first male nude centerfold in a respectable magazine, and as the author of Sex and the Single Girl. Who is she? Do you have five seconds? Helen Gurley Brown. That's right, yes. One out of one. And now, let's meet the president of the Liars Club, Alan Ludden. How are you? Wow, thank you very much. I'm glad you're with us. Hey, let's talk to Larry Hovis here for a minute. How are you, Larry? I'm fine, Al. Let me ask you a question. You're always asking me something. I'm curious. You've yeah. been with us now in the Liars Club for a bit. You've been exposed to all this stuff. How about you? Do you ever have any prevarications that you think are creative and interesting? Do you lie, Alan? No, I am really a lousy liar. I are really you? am. Betty can testify to that. She says if anything comes in here, it goes right out here, and that's the truth. You know. Is that true, Betty? That's true. He yeah. can't tell a lie. No. 
So just keep believing that, honey. Except just... he didn't tell me he was exposed on this show. You see, I didn't know. <laughs> you start out with a score of 100. You can bet half of whatever it is for the first put you're on. Okay, okay, I get, I'll never touch this thing again. It's there, it's there, we got a hundred. As if we haven't had enough. What's your bonus, Bill? Okay. It's a ball washer. <laughs> and rejuvenator. Like, uh, you got your old balls, you put them in there. <laughs> and uh, uh, they have to be Dunlops, because the Dunlops are smaller than the Titleist, you understand? The English balls are smaller, and you put them- Always said that. You put them in there, you put that on, you put your grommet inside, that's the outside covering, it fills in the cuts and stuff, and it puts through a solution, and the solution under pressure just fills in the cuts of the ball, and then he, uh, the paint goes in afterward, and it gets repainted, and it stays in there for a little while, and some heat goes through, and then you take them out, and your balls are as good as new. Okay. <laughs> and welcome to Lingo, the game that tests your knowledge of five letter words and, more importantly, tests your ability to think. Two more letters. B and an M for $64,000. B-E-A-N. And you can yes. buy a lot of B's. Oh, oh, um, brand? B-R-E-N-D? Yes, that's good. Brand? What else could it be? Oh, oh bland. bland. Yeah. B-L-A-N-D. from Poland, where he had been living. After being separated for eight and a half long years, Alexandra Potemski anxiously waited to be reunited with her son. Alexandra and her husband left Jakub in Poland when they defected to America in search of better job opportunities. Shortly after they arrived, Jakub's father died. 
and alone, Alexandra's efforts to bring her son to the state seemed hopeless. But with the help of her new fiancé, Alexandra not only was granted political asylum, but as a result attained a permanent visa for Jakku. It's just the most thrilling day of my life. It's just it's incredible. It's like a kid from another planet. I mean, he's never seen a freeway or a supermarket or a Disneyland or a McDonald's. I can't wait to take him into McDonald's. <laughs> They were married by the end of 1986, and he adopted my brother Jakob, making him child number seven. So I wasn't there for any of what we've seen. I was born in 1987, child number eight. Uh, to me, all that history was more of a myth, a tall tale, and rightfully so, as he was a larger-than-life character. Um, growing up, I didn't see any of his big successes. I knew a man who never gave up, who never stopped going, a man who failed often but never let that stop him from moving on to future successes, who smiled and laughed every day, who was tenacious and most importantly optimistic, who was always there for me and helped shape the moral character that I am today, a man who lived his life his way and no one else could say anything about it, never a shred of doubt in his actions or regret, he was a loving and caring father and that is perhaps his greatest accomplishment of all. I look back and I am inspired by his career. He was involved in politics, produced two movies, wrote two books, had a radio show, wrote some songs that we'll hear. Uh, he, had a, he flew airplanes, he loved airplanes, started companies, and much more. But the thing that I will always remember are the times that we spent together. Him teaching me to drive, him always helping me, him teaching me how to build, and giving me his attention no matter what else he had going on. Unfortunately, I didn't mature to a point to really appreciate him uh, and everything he did for me before he started to fade due to Alzheimer's. We had our differences over the years, and we didn't always see eye to eye, but fortunately I can say that I was there for him when he needed me, as he was there when I needed him. When, yes, exactly, when I needed him. Um, as difficult as the last few years have been, seeing my dad slowly disappear, I am a stronger person because of, because of it, and uh, I will move on with his spirit and tenacity inside me. Um, about a year and a half ago, uh, my mom took a trip to Poland, and I wanted to give my dad one last hurrah, and so I have one last video to show you. Took my dad to Disneyland. Went on the Mark Twain boat. Ate some churros. Rode a roller coaster. Uh, then I let him drive, which was something that he hadn't been able to do for a long time. Uh, and I didn't tell my mom about this at the time because she would have been very angry. Uh, I took him to an open parking lot at the, uh, at the Rose Bowl, like he did with me when he was teaching me how to drive. And then I even let him fly a plane. This is him taking off. I am in the back, terrified with the camera. But. <laughs> You did great. Was that fun? Yeah, of course it was. You want to do it again sometime? Yeah, anytime. But first I want to try to get my license. <laughs> Alright, I, I love you Dad. Uh, I'd now like to invite uh, any of my other siblings who would like to speak. Hi everybody, I'm uh, Rick Andrews, the second oldest son. Brother Bill is 20 minutes older than me, <laughs> so they don't let me forget. Um, so I, I recognize a lot of people here, and a lot of people I don't recognize, but I think I know <laughs> from back in the work days. And it's uh, great to see everybody here. Um, I can say that, you know, I, th I thought my father was indestructible when I, but I thought. He'd be here forever, never die. <clears throat> and uh, 
you know, I used to think that about our whole family. We, you know, we're, you know, I used to brag that, you know, here, here we are, and I'm in my late 50s, and both my parents are still alive, all my brothers and sisters are still alive, and there was something about the Andrews family which meant that we were always going to be. Um, and I lost my brother in, in a few months ago, and followed, uh, followed by my father just a few weeks ago. And, and it's been, uh, it's, it's been eye-opening as far as, uh, you know, we're in the real world and everything, and sad, sad what's happened. Um, the thing I remember most about my father is he was always there. He was a, good, a great father. Uh, he was always there for all of my school events, uh, track meets, uh, anything I competed in. He was there for my graduations. He was always there even though, as you saw from the videos, he was very busy. He had a lot going on. He would travel a lot. He was out of town a lot. But somehow he always managed to be there for us. Uh, when Bill and I were away for high school, he, we had to tell him, don't visit us so often. <laughs> we, wanted, we wanted to be by ourselves. So it's, um, you know, and be on our own. But, uh, but uh, he was always there. Good father, taught me a lot of things. Um, and um, I guess that's, that's about it. I can say I just... You know, I, I always knew him as a, as a TV game show producer, but he uh, was always my father. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for going first. Uh, but I, before I say anything about my father, I want to say how proud I am of my brother, Matthew. Uh, yeah. The youngest in our family is the most amazing brother I mean, the things he's pulled off and taken care of my father and things like that has been absolutely amazing. But <clears throat> what I want to say is that my father, one thing he did really well was he manipulated all his kids into doing different things that he wanted. <laughs> and I could say that's true for half of us. And the thing that he wanted me to do was find a cure for his aging. Um, he, he inspired that into me when I was 10 years old. Um, <clears throat> it's well publicized and stuff like that, the history of that. And so it was a mission of mine forever, ever to do that. But, you know, he ended up succumbing to that disease of aging. So did my younger brother. They both succumbed to dementia. Uh, you know, we won't know if it was actually Alzheimer's or some others until later. <clears throat> but it's like a horrible, horrible disease. And it's something that I want to see an end to. Uh, we've developed this whole attitude that this is normal, and that you know, even people like my father, they lived a good life. He had a full life. You know, I wish I could think of a, well, hogwash. That's <laughs> a word that I could say is not so bad. It's it's a horrible thing, and I think that we've got to do something about it. And if for no other reason, in, in the in the in for my father's sake. That was something he really wanted to see happen. And we just got to see an end to this whole awful disease. Thank you very much. So I'm James. I'm the one that had the sword, chased all my brothers. That sword always got taken away from me for obvious reasons. I was going to tell you a story about my dad. He always loved to take me on adventures. Like we go on camping trips, but they weren't normal camping trips. Uh, we, uh, he had a friend that uh, it was in the Channel Islands. One of the islands is a is a private island. It's like a it's like a hunting island, and you're not allowed on this island. So somehow he got permission to go on it. And so my brother Peter, my dad and I went on this trip. But my dad forgot to tell us, like, the first 30 minutes, what's going to happen. And this is before, like, email or, like, and the only conversation he had to the island was on a phone call. So the island, 
then have a beach. So it was a rocky island. And so when we went off, we had to match the waves and get just right, kick, kick the engine off, and then jump off. And I said, Dad, I don't, I don't want to do this. I am terrified. He said, don't worry, nothing will ever happen to you. And so to that day, I never, I would do things, I do things now kind of crazy. Um, and I never get hurt. Well, well, you know, not, not too bad hurt. Yeah, so we, so we jumped on that, my brother Peter jumped off, he grabbed me, because I'm just a little guy, and we get on an island, and we're hiking. And my dad says, oh, by the way, there's going to be a guy, and he's going to meet us, and do whatever he says. <laughs> and so, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. So we're just walking, and you hear this, this guy cock a, a shotgun, and he shoots it up in the air. And he tells us, get on the ground, face down. And I thought, okay, we're going to, at this point, I think we're going to die. So, but this wasn't the, I mean, this wasn't like the first time I've been shot at, you know, hanging out with Dad. But, you know. <laughs> so, we're laying face down, Peter and mine, and Dad takes out a handkerchief, and he waves it. And then he gets up, and he goes, talks to this guy. And there wasn't like, there's, you know, I mean, it was like, well, you know, me and Peter were talking and saying, well, hopefully we make it through this, you know, and this is, you know, the right place. And so he talks to him, and sure enough, we have this island. I don't I have no idea what island it is. I just know that it's a hunting island. So we spent, stand, uh, we uh, were there for a week, and it was just enjoyable. But I will never forget the first 30 minutes. <laughs> and so, but he was, I mean, he did... I mean, some of the stuff he did was kind of crazy. Like, I don't know if any of you ever in the LAX and during traffic, he always would, he always kind of like was late to things. And it was Peter and my, it was Peter, my dad, and he'd always leave like 30 minutes before his plane would take off. <laughs> and he had, sometimes he'd have his own special lane, but. He got there, and the plane was already on the runway, and that that didn't stop him. Um, so he got the luggage from Peter because Peter watched him. He, Peter Vaughn told me a story, and he ran down the they ran down the steps, and the the runway, the, the I think it was the DC ten, and he ran out to the plane and it's moving and he's banging on the plane <laughs> and actually the plane stopped and the door opened and the stairs came down and he got on <laughs> but that's that's was my dad i mean like and so i grew up thinking like he's superman like there's nothing nothing could stop him and you know the kids you know, all of us, we do, we do some pretty crazy things. And it's all because of Dad, you know. I mean, he just said, you know, he did, there was no, like, cap. Like, you know, you can't do this. And even in college, when, when I go to college, I was 20 minutes late to a final. I didn't care. I went in, aced the final, sat down. I, I, I'm never afraid. I know, and from him, I was never afraid. You know, it's hard to make me afraid of things, and it's because of Dad. So, thank you, Dad. So I was a latecomer to the party, having been raised in Poland. Uh, I grew up my aunt and uncle and my grandparents. Uh, had two father figures, but I never had a father until I came here. And he truly embraced me, welcomed me to his home, uh, raised me right, I think. And as Bill was saying, he manipulated his kids, and he manipulated me to go to West Point. Uh, and it's in the military, uh, and this is a career that I've had now for 16 years. Having been around the world, met several presidents, dignitaries, I can tell you right now that Ralph is the most amazing man I've ever met, uh, and I've met a lot of people. So thank you for everything. Yeah. Hi, I'm Phyllis. I 
wasn't going to do this, but I would never live it down if I didn't. <laughs> so um, I just want to reiterate something my brother James said. My dad made us believe that all things are possible. We can do anything we choose to do. And nothing will ever stand in our way. And my father gave me and all my siblings the gift of an amazing self-esteem. There is just nobody better than us. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're the best there is. All of us. Isn't that true? Yes. And I'm looking at my nieces and nephews now. They all agree. Um, and that's the gift that Dad gave us. And he was an amazing man, and I love my dad very much, and he loved me. He loved me as if I were his only child. And I know he loved all of his children that way. I would never felt like I was just one of a whole bunch of kids. I was the most important one. Just like you were the most important one, and you were the most important one. And you, that's how dad made us feel. And and I will miss him very, very much. I love my dad. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm Jeffrey. This is Ryan. And we are going to try and play a song that Ralph wrote for you. If you've heard this song before, I'm sorry. It's going to be really good. <laughs> This song is called An Empty House. Through sidewalk cracks, the weeds grow tall, through broken glass, the wind does call, there's been no paint for many a year, and yet I know there's someone here. Listen, did you hear a noise? Little Johnny laughing in the hall. They said he's playing with his toys. And this old house ain't empty after all. And now I hear a lover's fight. They do it almost every night. Come to bed. And turn off the light. Grow tall through broken glass. The windows call. It's been no pain for many a year, and yet I know there's someone here. Listen, he's got his cap and gown. The little boy stands so tall. Listen, the happiest place in town. After all, now I hear the sound of love. He wants the girl he's thinking of. And he's in love. He's really in love. He wants the girl he's thinking Oh, 
walls of broken glass, the wind does call, there's been no peace in many a year, and yet I know there's someone here. Listen. Thank you. Uh, Gary Bernstein was going to be one of our speakers, but he um, <clears throat> got sick or something this morning and couldn't couldn't make it. So he, he sent me something to read. Um, so I'll go ahead and read it. Uh, Gary was uh, a very important part of my father's life and <clears throat> did a lot with him over the years in the game show business and, and such. But. <clears throat> um, he says, my deepest condolences to the Andrews family at the loss of, of the very great and dear Ralph Andrews. Unfortunately, I have two impacted teeth and my mouth is swollen, head is throbbing, and, and I'd be there in person to mourn and to celebrate my dear friend and mentor, Ralph Andrews, who I love dearly and will miss forever. My history with Ralph and the Andrews family dates back to the early 60s. We were neighbors and friends. Peter, may he rest in peace, was my childhood friend. My older brother, Mark, may he too rest in peace, was close friends with his twins, Rick and Bill, and I remember Mark well. <clears throat> my mother and Peggy Andrews were, were co-den mothers of the Cub Scouts. It was during that time that Ralph sold You Don't Say. The Andrews family became wealthy and moved from Canoga Park to the Hollywood Hills, and he says, insert the theme from the Beverly Hillbillies here. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I guess I, rem I remember that pretty well. He's pretty right there. The story is the same, but Ralph's code wasn't Texas tea. It was the longer lasting commodity called talent. My family and I missed the Andrews. Uh, we were all regular fans, if you don't say, and followed Ralph's career like any close family friend would have, but from afar. I was inspired by Ralph from age four on. Little did I know at, at that time that someday our paths would cross again. I was working for Alan Ludden at MTM AM as head of development, when one day Alan came in to say Mary Tyler Moore had pulled the plug on Alan's venture, which, which she had with Grant Tinker. Alan said, don't worry, Gary. There is someone I've arranged for you to meet. His name is Ralph Andrews, and I'm pretty sure he'll hire you. I get goosebumps just typing those words. I did not tell Alan of my history with Ralph as a child. I met with Ralph, loved him instantly, and he hired me on the spot. He did not know and I did not tell him that I was the little boy from Sunny Bray Avenue that occasionally ate at his home. About a month later I told Rick. It was a wonderful reunion always filled with love. By the way, he did tell him later. <laughs> um, Ralph was such a good man. He was so kind to me and my family. He once came into my office and overheard me talking to my mom. Her junky car had just broken down in, in the rain and she had pushed it all out of the intersection herself. He knew how upset I was. The next day, Ralph, because of his extremely good heart, insisted he lease a new car and he adorned it with the license plate, GB's mom, GB for Gary Bernstein. I love you for that, Ralph, and thank you again. Ralph was unpredictable. One set of taping of lie detector, he came over to me and whispered in my ear, you're the only one I'm telling this to. I'm about to have a heart attack and ask you to rush me to the emergency room at Cedar sinai oh Act worried and concerned. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Why don't we call an ambulance? He said they might. He, he said they might know he was faking. He couldn't risk that. He did, and he needed to avoid going to court here in the next day. <laughs> well, I don't remember that. <laughs> then he said, if you pull this off, you can borrow my Rolls Royce until I am out of the hospital. You got a deal and a big heart, and the, and the heart attack began. Months later, I got, I got him back. We always pranked each other. He needed to know if my brother, who ran a TV production school, 
had, had someone who could travel with Ralph, spent the night with him in Oxnard and helped him with the presentation, yet again in court. We, we got him a guy and, and told this guy that this could be the start of a big career working as a famous producer. For this to be successful, we told him we had to let him in on Ralph's secret. We told him that Ralph was deaf in both ears. <laughs> of course, that wasn't true. <laughs> then we told him Ralph can only hear a little bit out of the right ear, and you need to lean into his right ear and scream really loud so he can hear you. <laughs> we, practiced, we practiced getting his volume up as high as possible on the to Ralph's house, where Ralph was to leave the door open for the kid. When he arrived, Ralph was in the shower, on, in the shower on his bed, and on his bed he had a new Armani suit laid out ready to take to wear the next day. My brother told the kid that Ralph left it out for the, for the kid and Ralph wants him to try it on. <laughs> once, the, once the kid was dressed in Ralph's suit, my brother and I left. <laughs> we, we stood right outside the front door with our ears on the door to hear Ralph's response. Two minutes later, we hear Ralph scream at the top of his lungs, What are you doing in my brand new suit? To which the kid replied, Twice the volume of Ralph's scream. <laughs> so you can see how it fits on me. Why in the world would I give a, a blank on <laughs> how my $5,000 suit fits on you, Ralph continued. My brother and I were almost besides ourselves listening to the exchange. Two days later, upon Ralph's return to the office, I asked him how the kid did. Ralph said, I am not sure. I am just about over his, this, this splitting headache. Something odd about that kid, he must be hard of hearing when he screams instead of talks. I owe most of the good things that happened in my life, in my career to Ralph, including meeting students, Susie Simons, Susie is there, who, like Ralph, did play a major role in my success. From a historical note, the Andrews family may not realize that only one time in American history had the child of a sitting president had a television series that was Lingo starring Michael Reagan. And I thank Ralph for making Larry Holvis and I partners on that historic and fun project. I will never forget Ralph and will never forget the fatherly figure and friend. He was that he, the yeah, fatherly figure and friend that he was. Please rest in peace, sweet man. You did much good here. Love to all the Andrews family. You have reason to be very proud. Gary Bernstein. <laughs> Just a note from me. I'm really sorry Gary couldn't make it because you know he was a childhood friend. He was he was he adored my father. He was always with him. He learned everything from him. And it's something he didn't mention in here. Before he went to work for my father, back when he was a little kid, he used to set up game show sets in his garage and run through run throughs with the neighbors' kids and things like that. Actually, thinking game shows. So he was a he was a game show person, just like my father was. And I'm sorry he couldn't have made it today. Hi, I'm Scott Yegman, Bill Yegman's son. Um, Bill and Ralph were partners. Andrews Yeagman Productions. Um, how do you follow that story? <laughs> but that, that is pure Ralph. Um, I, I knew Ralph when he had hair, okay? Um, or the semblance of hair, I guess. But, um, you know, he was a character. He shaved his head when it wasn't fashionable, except for maybe Yul Brenner or Otto Preminger. Um, he, he was a big personality. I remember you could hear him laughing from one end of Ralph Andrews Productions, the building, to the other. You could hear him laughing. And Ralph was always having a, a great time. Um, I, I don't remember him uh, being anything but kind to me, to be honest with you. Um, uh, he gave me my first job, in, uh, well, my, my first real job in, uh, in the entertainment industry. Um, I worked on uh, Liars Club, and um, uh, I was going to say, you know, my even though 
Ralph and, and my father, they dissolved their, their partnership. Um, Ralph still hired my dad many times to direct and produce and, and all that. And um, I think of them as brothers. Um, you know, despite their differences, they loved each other. And um, anyway, I worked on Liars Club with Larry Hovis. And uh, I kind of like to think that they're having a big reunion up there, you know, with Larry and my dad and Ralph and, and Peter and, and, you know, whoever. I mean, there's so many people that aren't here today that have moved on. Um, let's see. So, yeah, Ralph also sponsored me into the Director's Guild. Um, and Rick sponsored me to get my director's card. So uh, Rick and I had a partnership. So I have a lot. I, I owe a lot to Ralph Andrews. Um, and I remember um, one time I, I was at some party. It was a Christmas party or something. And Ralph was there. And I had too much to drink. And he insisted that he drive me home. And he, he drove me home. No one's ever done that before. Um, but uh, I don't drink now, so don't, don't worry about it. But. Um, um, and I, I know we had a really great conversation in the car, but I can't remember what it was, because uh, I was drunk. But, um, you know, I mean, he was, a, he was a kind person to me. And after my father passed, oh, also when my father was in the VA, uh, I, my, my dad was sick for quite a while, and uh, Ralph would come and visit him. Um, you know, I mean, it, 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 he's just a good guy. Um, and after my dad passed away, we did a run-through of You Don't Say. I think it was for ABC. I mean, I don't know. There was many run-throughs, pilots. ABC went, I mean, uh, You Don't Say went through many incarnations. Um, and he called me up and he said, I want you to help me with this. I said, okay. So we did this run-through and he said, if this gets you know, picked up, you're producing it. And I go, great. He, it didn't get picked up. But um, he didn't need to say that. You know, he didn't need to do any of that. Um, and... So yeah, he, he's, he's been a big influence. And when my father passed away at, at my father's funeral, uh, Ralph was there and he got up and he, he spoke. And I mean, that's the only thing I remember from the funeral is Ralph speaking. And he told this story that um, uh, I thought was pretty cool. It was when they sold You Don't Say. Now, they went to New York, because that's where he went in those days to make the big deals. And so they went to New York and and um, in New York, whoever with NBC, I believe, you know, made them an offer. And it wasn't a good offer. And so they walked out. And they were very nervous about this. Like, what are we, are we crazy? And, uh, and sure enough, they got called back in. And they ended up getting the deal they wanted. Um, so it, it was a lot of stress, but they had really gone through a battle. And they got the show. It's a network deal. I mean, it's a big, big win. And when they got home, they were driving home, I believe, from the airport. And it was in my dad's car. My dad's car at the time was a 1956 Mercury convertible. And the convertible top didn't work. So it was stuck, you know, down for some reason instead of up. And it started to rain. <laughs> and Ralph was telling the story that they, didn't, they could care less if it was raining. It was raining really hard. And they're getting soaking wet, and Ralph was huddled under the glove, the glove box, and just laughing his ass off. And you know, they owned the world that day, and uh, that's how I like to remember them. Um, anyway, um, so I, I like to thank Ralph for giving me my first job, and for all the things that he did for me. And, and, and he did a lot of things, as you see, you know, from writing books to being a politician to being involved in all kinds of real estate things and game shows and you name it, Ralph Andrews did it. He was like the energi Energizer Bunny. And I think, personally, when he was flying that jet, he looked pretty good. I mean, the jet, the plane. Um, I think he looked pretty great, you know. Um, he was always just like a big kid. Anyway, God bless you, Ralph Andrews. Had a couple of letters submitted to me to be read here, but they're both 
pretty much essays. So in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, just leave these out on the table for anybody to read. One is from Brian Dyack and the other is from Herman Rush. Uh, it, Herman's, fortunately, was broken up into three parts, so I'm going to read one of them. Um, in the 1970s, Ralph invited jo Joan and I, I assume that's his wife, to his beach home in Oxnard and convinced me to join him in buying the adjacent 10-acre property. Ralph's enthusiasm and salesmanship once again won the day. Ralph and I bought the property and commenced a five-year war with the California Coastal Commission, Oxnard City Council, Ventura County, and a multitude of private citizens, all of whom were violently opposed to our developing this beachfront property. They wanted it to be a public beach. I'll never forget, after several, several years of arguing with the Coastal Commission, we finally had our day in court. We had a meeting with the Coastal Commission in Oxnard to receive the final approvals. At long last, after a long-term battle, when someone in the audience stood up and said, I object. The Commission asked this person who he was and the reasons for his objection. He stated that he represented the Sierra Club and that growing in the sand on our beach was a rare exotic plant and that building home would wipe out and destroy that plant. The commissioners asked Ralph and me to respond. We stated that we needed more time to investigate and requested that they reschedule our response to the following month's Coastal Commission meeting. They agreed. Ralph and I reviewed how we should respond. Ralph's recommendation was to go and simply unearth all the rare plants growing on our property. <laughs> Ralph contended it was our property, and there was no law against us uprooting the plants. We did so, and at the following Coastal Commission hearing, we came in with a large garbage bag, dumped all the uprooted plants on the table, and said, the problem no longer exists. <laughs> all of the plants have been destroyed, as you can see. The building of homes would not do any further damage. The commissioners were not happy with us, but Ralph was correct. And in the final analysis, they granted us approval. Ralph was a visionary, and today you will find the property in question with 10 homes and 10 happy families, as well as seven acres of public beach we donated to the city of Oxnard as part of our, part of our settlement. By the way, this was a most profitable project. Uh, thank you, Herman, for that. Um, as many of you know, there were very few things in this world that angered my father more than smoking. <laughs> and he wrote a song about it. So uh, I'd like to now welcome back to the stage Jeffrey Simon. And pay attention because we will be asking you to sing along. It's called Kissing a Smoker is Like Licking a Dirty Ashtray. It's a good one.
I tried to memorize what I wrote, but I'm not as good as I used to be about that, so I'll have to kind of look back and forth at you. But um, I was saddened to hear about Ralph's passing, and I was asked to say a few words. Um, it was a great experience working with Ralph and, and knowing the family, oh my. Um, as his secretary, we argued often. Hmm. But uh, in the long run, he made my life and many of yours very interesting and memorable. Although Ralph may not have been a religious man, I'm very sure that some of us are sitting out there and picturing him up there as our bald eagle, we called him, producing game shows with the angels. Um, remember that Jesus loves us all. And, and so, as we fondly remember Ralph, may we play, please say, would you join me in saying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I just meant to say that. Uh, I said it. That's it. Thank you very much.